Stand with me, if you will, this morning. I want to take you to the scripture. Interesting that uh, a week ago, I woke up with this scripture on my mind, and pretty much what I'm going to preach to you, I outlined it in my sleep. <laughs> and I woke up and went straight to my office and started making these notes. I love this portion of scripture, but some things started falling in place for me that I had, I had, I needed, I needed. Uh, Jesus in context here in the book of Matthew is dealing with the law and the ways of the Pharisees and introducing his followers to the whole concept of the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God that is at hand, but it is not yet. Some people say, explain the kingdom of God. It is at hand, it is among us, but it is not completed yet. But we get to live in the principles and the precepts of the kingdom of God as believers now. Because that's what's going to make the difference in the world when we are living out the principles of the kingdom of God. And I just have to throw this in and I'll read quickly here. But uh, if, 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 if you're wanting to know how we as believers, and I say this often, uh, but it needs to be repeated, need to look at world events and form opinions about politics and everything else. Don't, don't get into it until you have really understood Matthew 5, 6, 7, and 8. Because that is the manifesto of the kingdom of God. That is the foundation, the philosophical base of the kingdom of God. And everything else should flow as a believer, a part of the kingdom of God that is at hand. Everything, all of our decisions, everything should flow out of an understanding of what Christ came to do. Are you with me so far? So we're in that kind of setting right here. When the scripture tells us in Matthew chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, about that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because they were really thinking that he was going to come and establish his kingdom and, and overthrow the governments of the world. So they're asking the question. Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like these little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who be becomes uh, as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And anyone who welcomes a little child like this one uh, of mine on behalf is welcoming me. But if you cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to fall into sin, it would be better for you to have a large millstone tied around your neck and be drowned into the depths of the sea. Here's where it gets interesting. Listen to this. What sorrow awaits the world? What sorrow awaits the world because it tempts people to sin? Temptations are inevitable. But what sorrow awaits the person who does the tempting? So if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with one hand, one foot, rather than be thrown into eternal fire with both hands and feet. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better to enter eternal life with only one eye than you have two eyes to be thrown into the fire of hell. Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones. For I tell you that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly Father. And may God add his blessing to our reading of his word. You can be seated. Now, very, very quickly, <laughs> let me address. Cut your hand off. Pluck your eye out. He is not talking about self-mutilizing, mutilization. You follow me? He's not talking about that. But what he is talking about is treat the sin with such disdain that you take aggressive action to make sure that sin is removed from your life. That's, that's what that's all about. But they understood it right there when he said it this way because it would be the way to stop a thief from stealing would be to cut his hand off that he steals with. 
And Jesus is saying, well, you go back on Jesus' teaching when it comes to uh, the Beatitudes. He said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And he's talking about matter of heart that has changed because we are now followers of Christ. But I would say to all of us, if there is anything in our life that is causing not only us to stumble, but causing others to stumble, we need to take desperate actions in our own life with the grace and the help of God to remove ourselves as much as possible from that temptation. Will we ever get away from total temptation? Jesus said, it's inevitable. Temptation, it's inevitable. But know that sorrow awaits anybody who allows themselves to be ruled by such temptation. So, it's very important for us to understand that he is not talking about us literally cutting a hand off or plucking an eye, but he's saying take drastic measures because the end of these things result in a disappointment of not enjoying the things of the kingdom of God or even eternal life. Then he goes on to say in the last verse right there, uh, beware not to look down on these little ones for I tell you that your heavenly, that, that in heaven their angels are always in the presence of my heavenly father. This is not just for little children, but the psalmist brings it out in others that we all have guardian angels that are on assignment. Angels are always on assignment to minister grace to us and in the presence of God, they are summoned perhaps. I don't know how that all works, but I do know the scripture tells us that they are here to fulfill and to carry out the will of the Father and to lead us, to protect us, to guide us. Have I ever seen my angel? No, but I've been very much aware of the presence of an angel before. You know, our, our, our two oldest grandchildren uh, this week we got to talking and I don't guess they had ever really paid attention to this, but uh, Cozy said something to them about, uh, they're all playing golf right now, junior golf, you know. And so we were talking about driving home from a, a junior golf competition when the boys, Christopher had to have been, I think, maybe 10 years old and Stephen 12 or maybe 11, 13, that, that group right there. We're driving home from Little Rock. And uh, dog tired out in the sun during the summer following them play golf. And as we're going home, both the boys are asleep in the back. I'm not doing good driving. Cozy takes over. She's driving. We've got an Oldsmobile Cutlass. And I'll tell you that reason for that in a minute. And we're driving home and we're on the right lane, the slow lane. And in the fast lane, there's a pickup. There's a, a, a Datsun then short bed pickup. And so Cozy just goes around it and she's going to get back in the fast lane, but she had to go around it in the slow lane. And as we were going by, I was just enough awake that I noticed at the same time she did, the window was rolled down on the passenger side of that vehicle and, and there was about six to eight inches of a rifle that was sticking out that window aiming right at us. And we both about the same time said, he's got a gun. And the next thing, boom. And it sounded like a cannon went off in that car. And he shot our car. Well, uh, being the control freak that I am, uh, I, I was saying, pull over, pull over, pull over, thinking I've got to drive, you know, because, just because, I don't know why, but I've just got to drive. <laughs> pull over, pull over. And Cozy said, I'm not about to pull over. I said, then speed up, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> And we pulled off at the next exit in Clarksville. And as we pulled off at the end of the, the, uh, the off ramp right there, straight across the street was a gas station. I said, pull in there. I jumped out of the car, went inside, told the guy, I said, need to call the police stations. We just been shot at on the road. That fast, I was talking to the police department and they said, can you identify the car. I said, yes, I can. As I'm trying to tell him, I said, matter of fact, he's pulling off the run uh, of, of, of the uh, freeway right now. And he's turning toward Clarksville. He's going downtown. And so I gave him a description of the car, everything like that. I said, stay there. Someone will be there in just a minute. So we're staying there and a police show up. Uh, highway patrol shows up. City police shows up. And uh, sure enough, they showed us 
where the uh, bullet had gone in, in that rubber strip that runs along the door panel of that Oldsmobile. And I found out later that rubber strip right there separates the bottom half is like double paneled, but the top half is not as paneled as the other. It has a lot of electronics and all that kind of stuff in it. But that bullet lodged in that rubber piece in the middle. And it was right where Cozy was driving and setting. The officer said this to us. He said, this is really interesting in that if you were no more than probably six feet away from that car and it's hanging out the window, how in the world did the trajectory of that bullet do this number and hit low in that car? Well, we're just saying, thank you, Jesus, because we believe God protected us. He did absolutely protect us. So we, we talked with him a while, and then he gets a call on his police radio, and he says, would you guys mind coming downtown with us? They have apprehended the man, and when they stopped his car, there was a little thing that went on. I think there was some gunfire that had happened, and uh, but we'd like for you to come down, give the story, and identify so we did. So we get down here with our two guys and we're walking in this police station and we walk by this room and here sets this man. And we recognized him as we walked by. Uh, and then we sat down and they said, well, here's the story. We hear from him. He's, <laughs> help me, hold with me here. He's off his meds and he's not in the hospital he's supposed to be in right now. And uh, he saw this white car coming up behind him and he said, they are devil worshipers and they were going to take you, take him and put him in the back of your, in the trunk of your car and take him away to which Christopher spoke up and said, but my daddy's a preacher. <laughs> so that covered the whole devil worship aspect of the conversation. <laughs> and then Stephen spoke up. He said, we, we, we couldn't get him in our trunk anyway. We've got all of our golf clubs back there. <laughs> what a moment. But when you're nervous, when fear is hanging at the door, you know, <laughs> we, we grab for the crazy sometimes and, and we just don't think right. Well, we drove home. I drove home. And uh, it was a tough night. I got up the next morning, never forget this moment, talking about angels, that kind of stuff. And uh, I was in the shower and I just had the water running in my face and on my head and I am crying. I'm telling you, I'd held it together until then. And I heard myself saying, Lord, thank you Thank you, thank you that you were with us last night. You were with us last night. You protected my family. And I heard the Spirit of the Lord speak to me and say, please don't ever reduce my presence to an incident in your life. I am always with you. I knew it, but I needed to hear it. <laughs> So I want to tell you there are angels that are to protect. This text is interesting to me. Matthew chapter 18, again in verse 3 through 9 in the NIV puts it this way. And Jesus said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become, everybody say change and become. Like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. See, Jesus was encouraging them to change from the sin of unbelief and change their thinking. And then as a result, they would see their actions being changed. But it's a progression. There's a change that's got to take place. There is a turning away from in order to recalibrate and turn toward. So he was encouraging them until you change and become. Well, so how do we do that? What are we talking about when we're saying we change and we come? We, we, we change from, let's say, law thinking to grace thinking. That's what he was talking about with them. Uh, you're, you're still caught up in the law, but here's what grace will do. Can I just throw this in here too? That I'm convinced that legalism, which comes out of the law, 
can most likely lead to some kind of abuse. Legalism. And uh, a people wanting so much the embrace of God through behavior, through actions, through whatever it may be, religious practices, find themselves in a legalistic category where they can't see the world around them. They can't see the needs of others. They can't appreciate those that are going through things that God wants to use them to help them through. Legalism blinds us. And you know how I feel about legalism. I, I, I feel so strong about legalism that I've made the observation. This is fun about knowing I've been here 40 years and I'm retiring after the first of the year. So I get to say a few things that I like to say, okay? I would rather deal with the demonic person than a legalistic Christian. I have authority over the demons. <laughs> but a legalistic Christian will spit in my face, I'm telling you and defend their actions all day long because that's what I believe to be the abuses that come out of legalism, religious abuses, physical abuses, a misunderstanding of scripture to give us permission to fall into that. It is inevitable that temptations are going to come, Jesus said. But to fall in line with that, God help us. We've got to make the change from law to grace. We've got to make the change from judgment to mercy. But they're wrong. Well, Jesus said, I know they're wrong, but let the tares grow up with the wheat and there will be a day when I will be the judge and I will take care of it. But stay out of that field thinking you have the right to do it. You're supposed to walk through there and declaring mercy Mercy, mercy and grace. Change and become from cursing to blessing. Oh, but it's, it's evil, it's bad, and we want to curse it rather than bless. You know, the scripture tells us is in Zephaniah where it says that mountain shall be removed. And we say to the mountain, be removed. And what we're doing is we're saying, the scripture tells us we're saying grace to the mountain, grace to the mountain. I speak grace over that mountain. I speak because I want to tell you there are, there are things, there are situations that are happening in our world that are so bad, but sometimes we get focused on the one evil person or evil thing and we don't see all of the people that are hurting around it that have been touched by it. We can get so sidetracked. That we're quick to curse rather than saying, God, I'm going to leave that to you and I'm going to look for those that need a blessing, those that have been hurt by it, those that need somebody to embrace them, somebody that needs a hug rather than a fist in their face. Well, I feel like I'm preaching good and some of y'all not sure about that. <laughs> we got to change and become a people who move from defeat to victory. We are not defeated. And I, I hear often, but the church, the church. I try not to take offense over things. Uh, Cozy's the best at that. Cozy looked at somebody one day and said, if you're trying to offend me, I choose not to be offended. And I thought, isn't that beautiful? I just love that. I wish I had that anointing on my life, but I have to go pray about it for a little while. But I, I think it's very important for us to understand that, that we as the body of Christ need to start looking at things from the perspective of the church is here to stay. It's got the blessing of God on it. It's got the anointing of God. It is one of the vehicles that God is the body of Christ that he is using until he comes again. And we throw it all out the window because we don't like some of the things that are happening in some places. Oh, please don't overlook the value of assembling yourself together with brothers and sisters of faith and moving collectively toward the common good for the glory of God. Praise God. Moving from a thinking of defeat to victory. And then also moving from this place of anticipating the worst to anticipating 
the best. And I know some people just don't like to get in that conversation with me. Well, pastor, what do you think is going to happen? Well, Jesus is going to come back. And I know what we have in store for us as believers. And it's great. It's wonderful. And our future looks good. And I'm anticipating good things happening. I'm anticipating the good news going forth and changing lives for the glory of God. The church is not going under. The church is not going to be defeated. The church, the body of Christ, is triumphant and will be raised triumphant. <laughs> Praise God. Amen. You know what the progression is in the scripture? It is from glory to glory to glory to glory. Praise God. Well, now if you have difficulty with some of these changes, then I would encourage you. Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, I would encourage you to think of it this way. Christopher helped me with this many, many years ago when he made this observation. He said, Dad, there is a, and he's preached it here, there is a corresponding virtue, a, a fruit of the Spirit for every need, every, every thing, every temptation, every trial, anything we go through, there is a corresponding virtue that we need to attach to that and pray that over the problem. Amen? Amen. Praise God. It's like the guy riding the bicycle who there's nothing out there except one tree. And you can tell him, don't hit that tree. Whatever you, whatever you do, don't hit that tree. There's a, a great probability that he's going to get so fixated on that tree that though there's nothing else out there, he's going to hit that tree. I encourage you not to be that focused on the problem that you hit the problem over and over and over again, but look for the corresponding virtue of the fruit of the spirit, of self-control, of patience, of kindness, of goodness, of love, of peace. Are you following what I'm saying? And pray, make that your prayer. Oh Lord, today, you know, and he does, you know what I'm facing, so I'll just leave that right there. But today, give me the grace that I need to have self-control and not to be moved by what I see or what I feel, but the fruit of the Spirit, let it live in me today. Praise God. But how, how, how? Well, we change and become like little children. A willingness to change requires true humility. True humility means knowing ourselves and accepting ourselves and being ourselves, a purposeful attempt to be our best self for the glory of God and the common good of others. Uh, it's important that we humble ourselves. James chapter 4 verse 10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Uh, here's just a good word for you to remember. Humility precedes honor. Humility precedes honor. Preach your own message right there. Second thing I want you to see about this is that true humility avoids the two extremes that we all have to face. One extreme is this, thinking less of ourselves than we should. Remember this in Exodus chapter 3, it's where Moses protested to God. Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? He was thinking less of himself, even though God was speaking over him, you are the chosen one. Many times God is leading us because what he has gifted and anointed us to do, but we talk ourselves right out of it because we think, we don't think we can do it. We don't think we can do it. Thinking less of ourselves is one of the extremes that we've got to avoid. And then also the extreme on the opposite side is thinking more of ourselves than we should. 
Romans chapter 12 tells us this in verse 3. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give each of you this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourself, measuring yourself by the faith God has given us. Paul was able to write the letter and tell somebody else, read this letter to the congregation rather than walking up to somebody individually and say, you think more highly of yourself than you ought to. And in the congregation hearing this word that I'm giving you today, we can all look at ourselves and say, God help me. And it's not a, just a rebuke for one, it's a rebuke for all in the body of Christ. If we think... If we think, you know, I had an argument years and years and years ago with somebody who really had difficulty with the fact when I would say, uh, I am unworthy, I'm unworthy. God, I'm unworthy of the grace, unworthy of the love. And they would tell me, no, pastor, you're worthy. You have been made worthy in Christ Jesus. You are worthy. I said, yes, I know I've been made worthy in Christ Jesus, but I don't ever want to forget that I'm unworthy. If I start thinking I deserve what he has done for me, then I start putting myself in a special category thinking that I got something that nobody else has got. I want to tell you, all of us are sinners saved by grace. And thank God for the work of salvation that continues to manifest itself in our life on a daily basis as we grow and we mature in him so we don't think high, more highly of ourselves than we ought. The true humble person does not deny the gifts God has given but uses them for the glory of God. I love Warren Wiersbe's commentaries, and uh, he makes this observation. The selfishness and disunity among God's people is a scandal to the Christian faith. When Christians are living for themselves and not for others, conflict and division are certain to happen. When we live for ourselves and not for others, conflict and division is going to happen. Praise God. I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, CLC. Thank you, church. Thank you so much for loving Northwest Arkansas the way you do. Thank you. Thank you. Renee, where are you? There you are, dear. I know you always turn away when I call your name. <laughs> But the Renee house, that is a transition house for compassion, beautiful. But I get a phone call from Jennifer this week. Pastor, not sure what to do here, but somebody wants to give us a five-bedroom house in, in Bella Vista as another transition house. What, what do you think about that, Pastor? <laughs> Well, I think we ought to rejoice and we ought to pray and say, Lord, make us wise on how we're supposed to respond to this. But I want to tell you, one act of kindness will open the door for multiple opportunities. And God will bless those who are willing to be a blessing to somebody else. It just happens that way. Praise God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for loving Northwest Arkansas the way you do. Do I like all that's going on in our world? No, I don't. And oh, I can set the table with you and I can argue with the best. But the good news is the good news and there's still a possibility of lives being changed because Jesus is Lord over every situation. Praise God. An unspoiled child has the characteristics that make for humility. They trust, there's dependency, a desire, a true desire to make other people happy, an absence of boasting and self-desire to be greater than others. Those are some of the things that the innocence of a child brings to our understanding. By nature, all of us rebels, <laughs> uh, wanting, we're just wanting to be celebrities instead of servants. The truly humble person helps to build up each other, not tear them down. And can I say, we are either stepping stones or stumbling blocks. 
If children, and I want to close with this, this is very important to me. An obvious link that we see here is there is a father. There's a father. Good dad, bad dad. Can I say good God in people's eyes? Bad God in people's eyes. The bond of this family, the family of God, are so strong that they overshadow the values of any other, regardless how dysfunctional they all may be. But the values of the family of God override and overshadow all of those realities that many have to deal with. We have the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. We have a model of a family. Jesus taught us to cling to the revelation that God is our Father, and that's what he modeled in Matthew 6. And then also it was Jesus' most common reference to God throughout his life, whether speaking to others about him or speaking directly to him. He referred to God as Father. In his parents' Uh, Jesus explained to them, his earthly parents, I'm about my father's business in Luke 2. And then to Philip, he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the father. Whether on a mountaintop or in a garden or on a cross, Jesus addressed God as father. And so he taught us to pray that way. He taught us in that prayer, not only as a sign of respect, although it is that, but as a recognition of the intimacy that we actually now hold in relationship with God. He is our Father. It is so true that the Apostle Paul would enlighten us with this fact. Let me read this to you. Romans 8, 15. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. Aramic for father would be Abba. And our parallel to that would be Daddy. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since all are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if you are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. Our Abba Father is telling us you can go through suffering, but I will be there with you. I am there for you. How much closer could God move toward us than to grant us the privilege of calling him Father? He invites us into that beautiful, intimate place. Well, how do I arrive at that place of knowing him in such beauty and such security as my Father? Jesus said it to Philip. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. We need to come to Jesus and say, Jesus, be my Savior. And the revelation of him as Father, God, our Father, will become greater and greater to us when we have accepted the price that Jesus has paid for the remission of our sins. So my encouragement to you today as we come to the table of the Lord in just a moment, and in just a moment as we are going to be led in communion, Christopher will lead us to the place where we are saying the Lord's Prayer together. I want to encourage everybody in this place to be mindful of the fact that our Father who is in heaven, we hallow his precious name. And we pray that his kingdom come, his will would be done. And we pray that he will forgive us and he will cleanse us. If you've never prayed that prayer to say, Father, forgive me, I want you to know he has never turned a deaf ear to the request of anyone who has asked for his love to be manifest. For he forgives and his grace is sufficient in all situations. So we desire to change 
from where we may be to become all that he wants us to be. We leave the anger behind in order to discover the joy. And we leave our sins behind. And he said, I will remove them as far as the east is from the west. And they'll never be called to your remembrance again. In his eyes, we can say, but what I've sinned, Lord, remember. He'd, he'd say to us, but I don't remember that. I don't remember that. I forgave you of that. Praise God for his love. Father, in the name of Jesus, let your word that is spoken to us today speak loudly to us in our movement forward through the actions and attitude of becoming all that you want us to be. The changes we need to make, we're not alone in making those. Your grace is with us. And we ask for your guidance and your help. And thank you, Father, that you've got us covered with the angels who are watching our lives and on call to minister grace to us. We magnify you, we thank you, we glorify you in Jesus' precious name, amen.